Thanks, Simon. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, as Simon said, my name is Brian Makey, so I head up BSG Securities. And um, so when, when Simon contacted me and said, listen, we've got a spot to open in the power hour, um, I was quite uh, taken aback in terms of what do we want to talk about? You know, do we want to come here and sell product? Or do we want to do something different? And um, which led me to, to, to my topic, disruption or innovation. Because what do we know that is constant through, through business? is change. And change is either a good thing or a bad thing. And when looking into this subject, I was looking, change can either cause a disruption or could be seen as an innovation in the market. So through this presentation, I'm going to try and illustrate some companies, well-known companies, that through change has either fallen in the disruption bucket or in the innovation bucket. Oh, there we go. All right, so <clears throat> quick agenda for tonight. I'm going to go through some of the definitions. What is disruption innovation? What is this disruptive innovators? Then something that is on my radar, some stocks that I think could fall into either bucket. Some, one stock is African uh, ARC that listed today. And then, of course, can't come up here and not punt PSG securities. You know? So I'm going to take a small portion of the time to just tell you what we do, how we do it, and some of, and some of our value propositions. So <clears throat> through disruption innovation and disruptive innovation, everything in business is connected. So if we go through the definition, so the definition of disruption is a disturbance or a problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process. In isolation, you, don't, you can't really tie that back to business, can you? It's just a, it's just a definition. But in 1997, uh, a book written by Clayton Christensen, actually, he actually used the word disruption, and it made a lot of business sense. So he used the phrase in a way to think about successful companies not just meeting customers' current needs, but anticipating their unstated or future needs. His theory worked to explain how small companies with minimal resources were able to enter a market and displaced the established systems. Also, he said, Christian said that, this, the, the, that a disruptive business is likely to start by either satisfying the less demanding customers or creating a market where none existed before. So when mainstream customers start adopting the entrance offering in volume, he explains Disruption has occurred. All right, so that's the definition of disruption. Innovation. It is a term that can be defined as something original, more effective, and, a, and a, as a consequence, new, that breaks into the market or society. So we also need to differentiate between innovation and invention. So I'm just going to read you. I know it's a bit uh, boring, the, the definitions, but I think once we get through the definitions, we'll understand my presentation a little bit better later on. So invention can refer to a type of musical composition, a falsehood, a discovery, or any product of the imagination. Invention, for its part, can refer to something new or to a change made to an existing, existing product, idea, or field. One might say that the first telephone was an invention. The first cellular telephone was either invention or innovation. But the first smartphone was definitely innovation. And then disruptive innovation. So disruptive innovation is a term in the field of business administration which refers to innovation that creates, um, that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network displacing established market leading firms, products and alliances. <clears throat> so, so I tried to bring that back with a practical, ex uh, practical example. And so not all innovations are disruptive, even if they are revolutionary. So when you look, for example, <clears throat> the first automobile in the late 19th century was not a disruptive in invention because early automobiles were expensive luxury items that did not disrupt the market for the horse-drawn vehicles. The market for transportation essentially remained intact until the debut of the lower price Ford Model T in 1908. Then they mass-produced the automobile 
And that was a disruptive innovation because it changed the transportation market, whereas the first 30 years, the automobiles did not. So it takes time for it to, to take uh, place in, in disruptive innovators. So when I looked at some of the disruptors in the market, I looked at these six companies. So you think about the first one, Uber. Everybody, most of us use Uber, especially on a night out. You don't want to be caught by the police and have a, a nasty fine or have to pay a bribe or have a criminal record at the end of the day. But what Uber did really well is all they did was they changed how taxi services were operated. So they weren't inventors. Taxi services have always been around. All they did was they changed how people had access to it. So all the other companies, so I'll, what I'll do is we'll go through these one by one. And actually, so what I've tried to do is how the companies have evolved and how the income statements or their share prices have grown over the last couple of years. And some of them who haven't changed and the, and the impact on their, on their share prices as well. So the iPhone currently um, constitutes about 70% of the revenue of Apple. Currently, in the last quarter, they sold $78 million worth of iPhones. That's a huge amount of iPhones. So the iPhone was released in 2007. So remember 2007, most of us had a BlackBerry. That was the competition. BlackBerry took the market because of one thing. You had email on your phone. Everybody now suddenly had your office in your pocket. In 2007, the research in motion share price was $230 in July 2017 it's $9 so as the market evolved as their competition caught up research in motion didn't I don't remember when last seeing a Blackberry can anybody all of us have either an iPhone or a Samsung or these new Huawei's or but iPhone has still got the biggest portion of the market. Now, on the flip side, Apple's share price in 2007 was $19. In July 2017, $164. So through innovation, Apple has continued to be the leaders and will continue, still continue to be the leaders in this field because they spend a lot of money on trying to be the best. I think if you add up all the other smartphones out there, it won't even get to the number of iPhones out in the market. So Amazon. <clears throat> Amazon was started by um, Jeff Bezos because he wanted to have the biggest bookstore out there. In 1995, Amazon started as an online bookstore. Eventually, they brought out the Kindle and, 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 but now today, it's an online store. What they do prize themselves on, it's the A to Z store. I don't know if you've seen in the logo, A to Z, they have this little arrow that says you can get everything from A to Z from them. What they also did early 2000s, they used to employ editors that used to work at um, newspapers and all that, and they used to review the books, and they would recommend books to clients. What eventually happened was the readers would review the books and would recommend books to other um, people on the site. Therefore, no more need for an editor. So they fired that entire team. People are selling the word of mouth from users, are selling product better than someone else selling you what you should buy. They have a, in the, in the community space, they've done a study that says people would much rather buy a product or use a service that someone else has recommended to them than actually listening to the salesman because they trust them, although they have no idea who they are. And that's what this system has done. So what they did was by changing this model, you can see the share price has increased drastically over the last 10 years. Netflix, another, we all like Showmax and Netflix. So Netflix was started by Wilmot Reed Hastings, and as a result of him returning a DVD late and getting a fine for returning a DVD late, which he forgot he had, he came up with the idea of creating a subscription fee for video-on-demand services. Two years after he launched Netflix, 
He went to the owners, the CEOs of Blockbusters and said, listen, I'm giving you an opportunity to buy into my company. And they turned it down. When last have you seen a DVD store? Can't remember. They've gone out of business. So Netflix do have a DVD rental business, but it's one of the least lucrative businesses for them. So what other thing I thought, in my view, that helped Netflix is the internet speeds, download speeds. Remember, we all used to have like a dial-up connector. It would take you two minutes just to get connectivity. Now suddenly you're streaming stuff. Well, there's a, I think there's an ad on TV, Mother Buffer. We always used to get anything on your phone. It used to be buffering. So you couldn't watch anything. It wasn't worthwhile. But now internet speeds, it's on demand, it's live. You can even stream sports on your phone these days. The internet has been most probably one of their biggest contributors to, for them being a success as well. So Snapchat, I don't know how many of you use Snapchat. I know for a fact my daughters do. And it's a nice little app. You can change your face and you can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But Snapchat is aimed at the youth. And the youth doesn't have any buying power. When the youth is your target market and your advertising is not going to be wasted on a company like that. You would rather invest in a company where the target market is people who can invest in your company. And you can see it in the share price. The share has dropped drastically since it listed. So Capitech is also a disruptor. So Capitech was unbundled as a micro-lending firm from PSG Investment Bank in 2001. It listed in 2002 at 1 rand 74 cents. In July this year, it was trading at 873 rand. So that is a return of 70,000% from 2002 to today. And what did they do? They were focused on the low target market, low cost banking services. And what has it resulted in? They have now got 8.6 million clients. They grow their client base by 100,000 clients every month. Um, they have 796 branches and they have 5.8 million cell phone banking clients. From a micro lender to one of the most disruptive businesses in the market, they've been voted the most innovative bank two years running. And um, they've been making banking easy and affordable for the mass public. So these are disruptors in the market. Another disruptor is Curo. Dr. Van der Merwe's vision was to take quality, independent schooling, education, accessible to most learners. So what they've done is they've got a nice business model. They've got three models, Meridian, Curo Select, and Curo Castles. So Curo, uh, Meridian uh, is a cost-effective school option. So it will have more, about 35 learners per class, which is the normal Model C option. But you'll have more better teachers and better f facilities. The Curo Select is the more expensive option, more slightly cheaper than most private schools, but still slightly better and more expensive than the Meridian. And Curo Castles is their preschool. So they've got you from preschool to high school, and I'll touch on Studio, which will be unbundled later in the year, which is going to be their tertiary offering that um, Dr. Van der Marwe is going to be the CEO of. Also, the word Curo is Latin for run. So what they say, Mr. Dr. Van Amaro, when he talks about his company, he says, schooling is a race because it's a 12-year journey. And, th and that's where they got the name from. So they want to assist you through this race to make uh, a success of yourself. Please feel free to answer, ask any questions. Okay. <laughs> so innovation. So... According to CNBC, the top five innovators for 2017 are Uptake, Grab, WeWork, Lyft, and Airbnb. I don't know how many of you have heard. So we, most of us have heard of Airbnb. I don't know if you guys have heard of the other companies. So just a quick rundown of what these companies do. So Uptake is a SAAA-based product company combining data science, machine learning, and security with deep industry knowledge to drive outcomes in productivity, safety, security, and reliability that deliver value for your business. So what they actually do, they analyze your business, come up with a business model that makes your business more profitable. Grab is just another Uber. 
It is the Uber in Malaysia. So Grab is a technology company that offers a wide range of ride hailing and logistical services through an app in Malaysia and neighboring South Asian nations such as Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand. WeWork is an American company which provides shared workspace, communities, and services for entrepreneurs, freelancers, startups, and small businesses. In a nutshell, as a freelancer, you go to a company, you go sit at his desk, and for the time you sit at that desk, you pay for it. And you can use all their services. So the internet, the printing services. Uh, so it's like a little hot desk. Lyft is also another Uber. It comes out of San Francisco, California. And of course, Airbnb, an online marketplace where you can put your holiday home, your flat, your whatever up, and people can rent it from you. So those are the five top five innovators according to CNBC. So for me, I've chosen the following five. So I don't know if anybody has heard of NVIDIA. It was new to me as well. Uh, of course, Twitter, Facebook, Alibaba, and Tencent. So <clears throat> when we look at Twitter, so Twitter is competing currently with other mediums like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, WhatsApp, and Weibo. So Twitter is blocked in China. So currently, Twitter has around 500, 500 million users. Now, in China, Weibo, which is owned by Tencent, has 469 million followers, and another company called Sina Weibo has 368 million followers. So the shares also reflecting that they have, uh, uh, they, that they're having a hard time. Firstly, the, 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 the advertising companies are not investing more with Twitter. And you can see that lack of, uh, of, uh, of spend uh, in their share price. And there's no change in sentiment that I can see in the foreseeable future. Morgan Stanley has a target price of $10 on this stock. So currently the stock is at $16. It has dropped 14% in July and 17% in 2017. So although it's an innovator, it is something, it's, it's, it's almost on that bell curve where it, it's over the top already. They haven't reinvented themselves yet. And if it carries on like this, it's gonna go to $10. Another company, Facebook. So firstly, Facebook has no competitors. Nobody out there who, who competes against them. The share price has gained 400% since listing and advertising is still the major driver of revenue for, for Facebook. One of the things, in my view, that makes it also successful is no adult content on Facebook. So it's, a, it's a easy, you can give it to your kids, they can have a look on it, and you're not going to get any funny things popping up that they're not, a, not supposed to be seeing. So what they also do really well is they link advertising to your other searches that you do. So now a, 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 a friend of mine said he was looking for something on Gumtree. I like, can't remember what. Logged into Facebook and there was a Gumtree ad that popped up with the same searches that he had been looking for previously. So you can see the interconnectivity of the searches on the, on the products. So for those of you who don't know what 10 cents, we all know 10 cents because Naspers owns a big stake in Tencent. Naspers owns 30% of Tencent. When they bought the company, they paid $35 million for it. It is now worth $130 billion. That's the value in Tencent. So what is Tencent? Tencent is a leading provider of internet value added services in China and it was founded in 1998. Some of the products are Weibo, WeChat, QQ Wallet, Tencent Games, U2 and Artificial Intelligent Lab. So they are focused on machine learning patterns. So the U2 is a, is a, is a lab that focuses on machine learning patterns, recognition and cognitive technology. They have the AI lab, so artificial intelligence. The vision for that company is to make artificial intelligence available anywhere. So some of the companies that they own, so where they create a lot of growth for the revenue. Smartphone games grew by 
online advertising grew by 55% year on year, and the growth in other businesses driven by payment and cloud-related services grew 177%. So I know the, 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 the users of cell phone users in China has only grown by 5% in the last two years. So a lot of people have cell phones. But they seem to spend a lot of money on apps and games and value-added services where Tencent's made a lot of money on. So NVIDIA is a company that focuses on gaming, artificial intelligence, but most importantly is the self-driving. Everybody is getting into cars that they want to, to get themselves to drive themselves. So their biggest clients are Tesla and Volvo. And this week, Walmart has announced that they are ramping up their cloud efforts by investing in NVIDIA. So their cloud business, and you can see what it has done for the company. Since they've got partnered with big, big other companies, the share price has re, uh, reflected it. So Alibaba is an online portal with more than 1 million pre-qualified suppliers. So I don't know if anybody has actually gone onto Alibaba's website. It is incredible to see what they sell there. They, I saw a, I don't know what it is, it's a grease nipple cover. Plastic little thing, looks like a little lid that goes on a, on a bottle, for 10 cents. So the cheapest thing on their website is 10 cents. Then they have smart watches for three, four dollars. Then they have quad bikes for thousand dollars. They have a, a, what do they call it, a glass or gas filling contraption for $15,000. So they sell anything from A to Z. They supply mainly to China, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. The company was uh, um, created in, I think, 1998. They service more than 1.5 billion people in China. So they've also, this week, I think it was on Monday, they've launched a, what do you call, biometrics system in KFC that you can go and buy your Streetwise 2 with chips by them scanning your face. So your biometrics, you can now buy food at KFC. It's quite in so hopefully they don't make a mold of your face and go and... <laughs> so you can just see they've recently launched in the US. So they are very big at selling online. So they're like the Amazon of China. So they've now launched in America and they are selling Chinese products to the Americans. So you can just imagine what that's going to do to the share price as well. So we get to disruptive innovation. So we know disruptive innovation originate in low-end or new market footholds. And in my view, the following two companies are disruptive innovators. <clears throat> so we firstly know Elon Musk has proven on a big scale, that electric cars are no longer just a science project. Tesla also focuses on energy storing and solar panel, uh, solar panel technology. <clears throat> I think harnessing the energy in our batteries is still the biggest obstacle for, for, this, for this technology to be really, really, really successful. If you think about uh, we spoke about it earlier on Simon and myself. You go to a house with solar panels, they have a whole room full of batteries. Now, Tesla has now just recently also launched roof tiles that have solar panels embedded in them. So no longer you have this big solar panel, you have this solar panel in your roof tiles. <clears throat> so also, when I looked at um, the... What's the right word for it? The... Looking at electric cars, how much does it cost to run an electric car? So in the US, to charge your electric car costs you 12 cents per hour. That's the national average cost of electricity. So I don't know how long it takes to charge your car, but they did a study for a car that travels 100 miles, so 160 kilometers, the cost in electricity will be $4.64. And if you were driving a normal petrol car, would be $8.47. So it's a 50% saving in costs driving these electric motors. I, did a, I, I, I was looking at some 
I think it was Jay Leno's garage, and they were showing one of the Teslas, like a granny driving the Tesla, and he was in an AC Cobra, and they were going to do a drag race. And the AC Cobra has, I don't know how many kilowatts it has, and this little electric motor. This Tesla took off before this uh, AC Cobra could even hit second gear. It must have been like five car lengths ahead. Because the nice thing about electric cars, it's power on demand. Most of our cars with our kilowatts, you have to rev the thing to get the power into it. So electric cars are power on demand straight away. One of the other big things that Tesla has invested in is SpaceX. Space exploration. So they do 20 flights a year, and they have $10 billion in contracts signed up already. They were the first space exploration company to actually return the rocket back to Earth after it had been pushed up into space successfully. It doesn't crash in the ocean. The video I saw, it actually came back to where it took off. So this company is going to go a long way in, in the future. And you can see the share price reflects that as well. Another disruptive innovator is Google, or Alphabet. So if you told anybody 15 years ago, you are going to launch a search engine, and companies who want to be added to your search engine are going to pay you. You would most probably thought you were a bit mad. Now, that's what happens with Google. All of us, companies like PSG, we pay by using AdWords. So for every key word or phrase or sentence or anything like that, you bid with Google. And I'm competing with other people in the same industry. So whoever pays the most, if you go onto your Google search, will end up at the top. So like I bid on online share trading or offshore investing, but I'm competing with the other 50 brokers in South Africa. So whoever pays the most gets to be the top of the line. So with that, I don't know how many of you go to page two whenever you go to a Google search. So if you're on page two, you're lost. You've lost it. You want to be in your face advertising your company, and by doing that, Google raised 79 billion rand last year in AdWords. That's $350 million a day that all the companies are paying to advertise their company on their website. So, and that is 96% of their total revenue comes from advertising. You can see how they've disrupted the market. Because you think about AOI, America Online, you paid them to become a member to get their website. Now think about your ad, you're paying Google to be in the yellow pages. And you're paying them more to be on page one. So what are the companies on my radar? Who's next? So we all know African Rainbow Capital listed today. I can't remember where it closed, but the issue price was 8 rand 50. The company's joint CEOs are Patrice Motsepe and Johan Fransail. And the chief operating officer is Johan van der Merwe. Both of them come from Sunlum, and they have a long history in the financial markets. They are going to be a disruptor in the market for me for two reasons. They are getting a banking license in the next couple of months. So they are going to go after the rural areas, getting banking to the rural areas as well. So they're going to effectively be competing with Capitec. What they're also going to be doing is they're going to be doing it through cell phone banking. And I think Vodacom has partnered with them in that space to get banking to the rural areas. Another thing is they own a BEE broker, Indware Broker Holdings, which means they are a PIC, approved broker. So it means flow from the Public Investment Commissioner for all the pension funds and provident funds that they run can go through to Indware brokers, and they'll create a lot of flow for them. They also have properties worth 2.8 billion. So in the finances, they only shown 800,000, uh, 800 million rand because they've got debt against it. And they also bought 20% stake in Valdiv. I think the company in the makeup is a decent company. They have multiple investments. One of the investments, unfortunately, is into the alternative exchange. It's a bad thing to say on the JSE's platform, but. They've put 35 million rand into A2X. That's one of the investments. The alternative investments that they have, they've spent 600 million rand on. It's in their income statement. You can have a look at it. But they don't disclose all their investments. Another company that I think could do really well in the future is Energy Partners. 
it's focused on home solutions, water heating, um, steam combustion, energy intelligence. So the cost of electricity is just going through the roof. So we'll need to make alternative plans for that. What these guys do is they can supply you with alternative solutions. And you can see from their client list that they are a big company and they're a reputable company. The time has gone by by you having to buy a, a, a what do you call those things, a, a generator because of load shedding. A generator isn't sustainable. You need to get into a product that is sustainable in the long term for you to, to reduce your cost of running your household. So I spoke about it earlier on, Studio. So Studio is going to be the unbundling out of Curo. It's going to be the university. Dr. Van der Merwe deems it a multiversity. Why is it a multiversity? Due to the holding companies that they've bought or the, the educational systems they've bought, like a company called Centurion Academy, where people study to be hairdressers and, and uh, physiotherapists and massagers, that means that there's practical involved in it. So a university is mostly just you in, this, uh, in a lecture hall and there's not a lot of practical. So what they're doing is they're buying everything from A to Z, normal universities, as well as where practical comes into play. And it's going to be unbundled out of Cura. What they have already is a 70% stake in Southern Business School of Namibia after an Embury Institute. So look forward, most probably in the last quarter of this year, for Studio unbundling out of Curo. Any questions thus far? Awesome. So let's talk about my company, PSG Securities. What, what are we? Who, what do we do? So we, yes, we're a stockbroker. But we give you the ability to trade local, international derivatives all on one platform. One login, and you get access to all of that. We one of the lowest, have one of the lowest platform fees of the in the market of 40 Rand a month. We have competitive uh, trading rates. And something we have that most other brokers don't have is we have a direct sales team. So over and above our call center. So people who have more knowledge about the market and our products, other than that, than just going, I can't remember my password, or let's pay out some cash. These guys have proper degrees behind, them, behind themselves. They know the market. We educate them continuously so they can help you with your products and more, and more complex queries. We have a dedicated research team, which is headed by Franco Bretorius and five equity analysts. Each analyst covers an, an individual sector which makes it nice for us. So what do we do? Our research that comes out, we get research daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. We push out trade ideas as often as we can. We've got webinars around the trade ideas and the webinars on products and education, of course. So an example of our daily that goes out, goes out every morning at around 8 o'clock. It will give you market commentary, market indicators. The product matrix, because we're a wealth business, we have uh, unit trusts as well over and above the securities business, so that will be included in there. And then I have, we have our trade ideas. The last three trade ideas that we've pushed out was Woolworths, ShopRites, and MTN. And then you ask me, what does a trade idea look like? So I'll give you a quick example. So we give you a nice in-depth understanding of the recommendation of the company, comment on the results, the interdivisions within the company, and embedded in this little trade idea, we don't give you buy this, sell this, there's a target price. What we're trying to do is give you a portfolio recommendation. So we're saying, if you own Woolworths, or you want to own Woolworths, you should not buy more than the constituents of 4.21% of your portfolio. Because that's how we, we feel it is a, it's a good portfolio construction. So nice diversification, you should only have 4.2%. If you own less, it's effectively a buy signal buy more up to 4%. If your portfolio is only Woolworths or 10%, it's effectively saying, listen, you should light, lighten up a bit on Woolworths, and there could be another possibility for you to buy another stock into it. We also have a little triangle, which gives us an idea of the value, the quality, and the confidence of this company. And you can see, we say, we maintain an overweight exposure and recommend portfolio guidance of up to 4.21%. What we also did was, because we know 
it is different to what people usually get in a trade idea. So we did a small little webinar on how to read the trade idea, better understand it. So every time you look at the webinar, you understand what we're talking about. Because what we have is we have the analysts who actually present these webinars on the trade ideas. So you can see here, we had a webinar yesterday on MTN. The equity analyst was Taylor Wesson, and she would have presented the webinar. So she knows the company intimately, and she would explain her, her thoughts and explain most of the information that we have gathered for you as, as on, the pro, on the company itself.